So welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. This is a panel discussion on the documentary film, The Invisible Vegan. I'd like to welcome everyone as, um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Nicole Angel, Director of Sustainability at Aptera. Aptera is a San Francisco Bay Area nonprofit based in Palo Alto. We bring people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. And we focus on what you can do locally to address current environmental problems, in particular climate change. Our new strategic plan focuses on two big pieces of our Bay Area carbon footprint through our beneficial electrification and our Healthy Plate, Healthy Planet programs. Beneficial electrification moves us away from fossil fuels and Healthy Plate moves us towards a plant forward diet and less food waste. Tonight's program would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsor, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and their Spare the Air program. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District aims to create a healthy breathing environment for every Bay Area resident while protecting and improving public health, air quality, and the global climate. The Air District supports education, incentives, and partnerships such as this one to help establish the Bay Area as a leading area for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. I'd also like to thank our many amazing community partners for their support promoting this event. Thank you to Grounded in Community, Le Generacion, Peninsula Food Runners, Palo Alto Humane Society, Citizen Climate Lobby, Silicon Valley North Chapter, Sustainable Silicon Valley, Thrive, the Alliance of Nonprofits for San Mateo County, Sweet Farm, Better Chew, East Palo Alto Center for Community Media, Greentown Los Altos, Farming Hope, First Presbyterian Church of Palo Alto, Slow Food East Bay, Fresh Approach, League of Women Voters of Palo Alto, Veggie Lucian, and 350 Silicon Valley. Thank all of you so much. Okay, just a few technical items before we get started. If you have any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A box to ask them. You'll see the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will have time for audience questions towards the end of the program. If you have any technical problems, please use the chat box to communicate with staff. But again, please use the Q&A box to post questions for the panelists. Hopefully everyone has watched the film, but in case you learned about the event late and haven't seen it yet, you do have until the end of the month to watch the film using the link you received when you registered. Also, make sure that you hang out until the end of the program. We have some great giveaways, but you must be present to participate in the raffle. You'll also be able to learn about other upcoming events at that time. So now let's get started. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Henrietta Burroughs. Henrietta started her career in New York City as a newspaper reporter. She later became a TV news reporter and worked for several news shows where she won an Emmy, a Golden Medallion, and a number of other awards. She currently produces and hosts the TV show Talking with Henrietta, and she's the founder of the East Palo Alto Center for Community Media, which is a nonprofit organization that under her leadership launched East Palo Alto Today the first continuously published newspaper in East Palo Alto in 20 years. Henrietta is the proud owner of an electric vehicle and she's also a vegetarian. So I'll turn it over to Henrietta who will introduce and welcome our amazing panelists. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's really an honor to be here to talk about this very important topic. It's a topic that affects our health individually and it's a topic that affects the health of our planet. And on, during this discussion, we have some amazing people who will talk with us about a film that is really making waves and can bring about some extraordinary changes. So I'd like to have each of our panelists introduce themselves. So Lauren, why don't we start with you? Can you say something about yourself? Uh, my name is Lorna Nellis, 
and I'm the founder of Food Empowerment Project. We are a vegan food justice organization, so we work on promoting veganism for the animals. We have a couple of websites, um, veganmexicanfood.com in English and Spanish, vegan Filipino food in English and Tagalog to try to celebrate our communities. We also work on farm worker justice issue. This week, we're gonna be wrapping up our school supply drive for the children of farm workers that we do every year. We also work on the lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities. And we're trying to get people not to buy chocolate sourced from where the worst forms of slavery and child labor take place um, in the world. And so what we're trying to do is just try and connect the issues of um, food justice around animal rights and human rights. Thanks uh, for thank that. You. Thank you both for even being here talking about this topic. If it weren't for Jasmine, who's the person who produced the film. So Jasmine, please introduce yourself and tell us uh, something about how you got involved. Oh, so I'm an entertainment professional based out of Los Angeles and then I became a vegan and I was trying to tell all my black friends about it and they just didn't get it. So I was just like, how can I make them understand? And then I looked at a lot of the other vegan documentaries and I was like, yo, I get why they don't get it because a lot of these films, as great as they are as a collective, they don't really, re you know, they don't really reach out to different audiences. They kind of send the message to the same group of people. So I was like, okay, you know what, let me use my professional expertise to kind of fill the void and be the change that I want to see. So that's how I arrived at the documentary, The Invisible Vegan, that I directed and started. And fantastic. That yes, fantastic. <laughs> and so let's just go on across the board. Uh, Nicole, well, we know Nicole, so Chef Chu. Well, good evening. Um, I'm Chef Chu. I'm actually the, the founder of a company called Something Better Foods, um, where we manufacture plant-based protein uh, with the mission to uh, democratize the access of healthy foods, specifically plant proteins. Uh, many people know me um, as Chef Chu. I like to always say, going to give you something to chew on. And uh, I love to educate, bring love to the community, uh, sharing the wealth of plant-based uh, food and uh, into our community. So I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. And our next panelist, please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Ivana Francis Garcia. I am a community organizer and I'm currently the West Coast Coordinator for Veggie Mijas. And Veggie Mijas is a community based collective um, which aims to center queer, trans, Black, Indigenous people of color um, who want to learn more about adopting a plant based lifestyle. So I introduce our discussion by saying that uh, what we eat definitely influences our health and it also influences the health of our planet. And I would assume that all of you agree with that. And of course, <laughs> I can't say you might not, but talk to us about that. Tell us why being a vegan is important to our health and how that would influence the health of our planet. Jasmine, since you created the film, why don't you start out? Okay, so I think when people normally think about food, you know, I don't think people think about food a lot of the times. I think when I grew up, it was just this habitual act that I didn't know held any kind of power. And then I started eating a plant-based diet and I saw the difference that it made in my health. And I was like, whoa, there's actually more to this than just this daily habit. And then the more I started reading up on it, I started seeing all the connections. Like, okay, when I eat this piece of beef, I'm contributing to this cruelty. When I eat this piece of pork, I'm contributing to this environmental racism. When I eat this chicken, I'm contributing to global warming, which is gonna impact black and brown countries um, at a far greater scale than you know your European countries, America. So when you start seeing all those connections, it makes you, um, I guess, more committed to, as Lauren would say, eating your ethics. Sure, Ivana, when did you make the connections? Or did you make the connections, the same connections or different connections? Yeah, 
I think for me, um, when I first started my journey, it was more for the animals. But as I continued on, I continued learning and just really realizing like the food systems that we, you know, have here in the U.S. are heavily colonized. Um, and it is happening to everybody. But because of the inequities in our system, we do see that black and brown bodies suffer the most chronic diseases. Um, and so just kind of delving deeper into like, what are the causes of these diseases, you know? And so um, we've actually seen um, like, basically like colonialism brought in, you know, like pork, it brought cattle, it brought dairy, it brought sugarcane. Um, those are the things that are actually affecting, um, you know, that are affecting human morbidity rates more than anything. And so um, those are also the foods that are heavily subsidized and marketed. So, I mean, point blank, it feels like the system is trying to kill us, you know? So um, I feel like I actually saw Shelly Chapman on YouTube, um, elucidate so, really So okay. I'm thinking how could the system kill us and still have paying clients. <laughs> Is that for me? <laughs> for anyone who wants yeah. to answer, but yes, following up on what you just now said. I mean, it's really all for profit. I mean, our food systems is not for wellness, it's for profit, you know? So when you start to understand that, you know, you start to realize like, it's not really up to this corporation or this company to decide if I'm valid, if I'm worthy of fresh fruits and vegetables, you know? We are alive, we're here and we deserve to thrive, you know? So I think really just taking back our power, taking back our plate, taking back our health, you know, became really important to me. Sure, Lauren, what connections did you make in going? Uh, well, I went vegan in 1987, before uh, some people here were born. <laughs> um, and I was in high school. And I made the connection initially because growing up in Texas, I would see cows in the field and my parents were getting a divorce and I understood what separation was. And I didn't want to be responsible for separating the family. It just, at that young age, I understood there was a separation. Um, but being a, a Chicana, um, I also was raised on the great boycott, and I started to learn how food could be... I am so sorry for hearing the Spanish translation. Oh, We're sorry. losing you. No, not your fault. Okay. We're losing you during the Spanish translation that we can hear. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just for a clarification, if you do not want to hear the Spanish uh, interpretation, click the interpretation key and select off. There was a misunderstanding with the instructions. So we should not connect. Oh, I think so you, you, you will click, yeah, the interpretation key and then oh, select off. Okay. And you will not hear our interpreter anymore. Okay. Lauren, continue. I'm sorry. That's all right. So again, as a proud Higanix, I was raised with an understanding of the boycott against grapes and using food to help create better living conditions for farm workers. Um, I didn't grow up with a lot of. Um, money and so it took me a while to where i could actually go vegan and just started to learn that food can be used as a tool for social change and in the bay area have we have a wealth of of history with the black panther party showing us how this can be done in our own communities and so my path to um, all of this was basically looking at food as a tool for social change in a way that our food choices have power and can not harm human or non-human Thanks. You. Your journey. How yeah, did you me, get involved? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For me, I went vegan in 2001. Um, crazy, crazy enough, I grew up a country boy. I uh, grew up in Maryland, in the southern part of Maryland. My father literally was a sharecropper, so I ate everything from squirrel, rabbit. I missed possum by 10 years. Um, that's how country I was. But the reality, uh, early in my, like my teenage years, many of my, my unc uncles and aunts began to have, you know, the heart diseases, the diabetes, started seeing family members go on dialysis, um, this all the different diseases of the, the Western style of, a, you know, a sad diet, as we said. Um, and many of them actually started dying. So it literally started being like, you know, at, in their 40s, they started dying. Early 50s started dying. Um, I became a vegan in 2001. Um, and again, just made that transition. But again, missing, again, eating fried chicken, what I grew up on, I actually started wanting to create foods that I was familiar with. And so that got me super excited. And that started my long-term journey in becoming a chef to replace the stuff that I used to love to eat. So, yeah. So we're talking about social change. And there's a, an awful lot of money tied up into the meat industry. And we can talk about our own personal choices, but our own personal choices in this society are influenced by the advertising 
and what we see around us. So, so what will it take? We can talk about people changing their habits, but a whole transition, transformation in terms of the meat industry. And do you even consider that important? Well, I think one, um, one thing that needs to happen is the truth needs to get out because there, a lot of people don't even know that the food that they are patronizing is horrible for them. And a lot of the effects of that food we think is normal. Like I thought, oh, diabetes and high cholesterol, that is my destiny. And I think a lot of people think that too. Like it's just, that's a part of getting being old, but we don't know that the foods we eat contribute to that. So once people start realizing that, you'll have way less people supporting industries that make them sick. And I think Ivana made a point as well, this with the, the system that we're in in this country, a lot of the meats and even the cattle feed and things of that kind of support, that system is being subsidized. Um, you know, you think about, you know, how do you get a, a dollar hamburger? Um, that's almost, just from a practical perspective, the manufacturing process is way more expensive than the, the created at, at that type of price point. Um, and so there's been loans, you know, they've got so much funding that's been given to, you know, meat manufacturers, to farming enterprises that support this whole system. Um, and so there's a lot of systemic and this is, you know, this issues that have to be dealt with. The good news is that there's been a lot of awareness in the last past years that's been bringing a lot of awareness to these issues. The fight isn't over, obviously, but I do think there's been a, um, a change and a, at least an awareness that's been happening, you know, with a lot of the people that's on this, on this call right now that's bringing these issues to the table. Sure, and, and talking about bringing the issues to the table and the food to the table, getting back to that question, what can be done in terms of influencing those who produce the food, those who have the slaughterhouses, that bring the meat to the market. How do we make changes at that level? Because changes will have to be made at that level. Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I think that absolutely changes will have to be made. And I think that we're seeing some farmers make the changes right now because the animal dairy industry isn't doing so good. So a lot of these you know, farmers are actually looking into plant-based milks because they see, you know, they see the trend. Um, they see that the, the animal, the cow dairy is losing money and they want, they, you know, they want their families, they want their farms to survive. So they're figuring out other ways to make money. And I think that, you know, we need more entrepreneurial type farmers who are willing to say, look, I want to, I want to create healthy foods for everybody, for the planet, for my health, for my family's health. And I think that they need to be supported. Um, they need to be financially supported by the government, um, but they also need any, some type of, I don't really know enough about the economics of it, but something to really say that businesses that are looking out to protect human health, protect the environment, need to be given some type of break or some type of assistance. Um, when it comes to slaughterhouses and places like that, I mean, at the end of the day, those places aren't good for anybody, not non-human animals and definitely not the workers. Who work there as well um, and so with a situation like that I think that it's a matter of um, getting these workers into just transition to where they are transitioning to jobs that are better for them that they'll get paid well that they won't be you know dealing with hazardous equipment they won't deal with the hopefully the vast amounts of racism that and discrimination that take place in these slaughterhouses and again we have majority of people who are working there are undocumented and are immigrants um, so, you know, you got, you have, again, this perfect storm of, of racism, systemic racism and discrimination in the food industry that's right throughout it, but even more so when you look at animal agriculture. Sure. sure. Ivana, I don't want to leave you out of this. Yes. Um, I mean, for me, <clears throat> on like a consumer level, you know, I, like I said before, you know, trends drive changes. And I do really believe that we're seeing like this awakening, you know, of um, our younger generations who are being more like, who are, I think, becoming more conscious about how what we eat affects not only our bodies, but the environment as a whole. Um, and just kind of delving into the sustainable, like, you know, framework. Um, you know, I think these, these businesses, if they don't adapt, they will die out, you know, and like um, Lauren said, 
we are seeing a lot of dairy farmers move to oat milk, move to almond milk. We're seeing Tyson move to like plant-based meats. You know, everybody kind of wants to get in on it because the reality is like, you know, the vegan market is like exploding and it's only going to continue to grow. So, you know, yeah. So what steps, it's one thing to hear that going vegan or vegetarian is good for you, but it's another thing to change your whole lifestyle. So what steps can people take if they want to embark on this particular journey? Well, I think for me personally, I'm, um, it really, I think it starts with yourself and really just thinking critically about where does our food come from? Um, because once you start to understand the systems that are in place, you start to realize it's honestly like it's, it's out to get you, you know? And so, um, like I said, just, you know, I feel like in a system that wants to keep us sick, like the most radical thing that we could do is to take back our health, you know, is to stand up and, you know, I guess, against that. I'm so sorry, my cat. No. <laughs> She's because I'm nervous. He's showing in charge. Yes. Um, but yeah. Well, you know, it's very interesting because from Ivana, there's this idea that the industry is out to get us and we need to take back our health. And it almost reminds me of tobacco. <laughs> and there's certainly no question about the fact that tobacco is not good for you. And the tobacco companies don't seem to care. So Jasmine, do you think they're out to get us? The food industry, the meat packing. Okay. Um, you know, I think you have two things happening. Um, cause on the one hand you do have a system that's pretty much, you know, the food industry, like most industries they are out for profit. So you have that, but then at the same time, you know, industry is supply and demand and they are going to cater to the wants of the people. So to an extent you have a lot of people who are asking for these healthy foods. So the industry is kind of providing what they want. So you have this unhealthy kind of cycle. So instead of focusing on like just one side, you kind of have to focus on both. The manufacturers and people. And the people, yeah. Both sides. Jeff Chu? Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, you know, you know, we are in a capitalistic, you know, society. And so people are driven, businesses are driven to make profit. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, so as long as there is a demand for meat, there will be producers to make meat. Um, as, as, as the increase in awareness for plant-based becomes more overwhelming, um, meat manufacturers will begin to transition more and more to making plant-based foods. Um, I mean, I think, you know, this country is definitely, it, it run, the dollar runs a lot of the decisions. Um, ethics, you know, does become, as Lawrence says, eat without ethics, you know, that does become important for, for some, not all, for some. And I think we try to persuade all to try to, to get there, but I think that economics is obviously a driving thing in this country, and, I, and it's probably going to be a while before that changes. But I think the more the consumer, as, as Jasmine said, desires this, the more we can bring awareness I think that's going to bring a, a big damage, a, a change to the industry at, whole, at, at, a, at a whole, and it has. I mean, last thing I say, you know, the milk industry. I mean, we, we, I mean, 15 years ago it was, you know, there was, you know, soy milk hit the scene. Now we see it's like soy milk, almond milk, oat milk, rice milk, coconut milk, and almost like it's almost not even cool to drink regular milk anymore. And that's just for people that actually who are normally wouldn't even care. Um, and so there's definitely been a shift, especially in the milk side of things, the dairy side of things. People are going plant-based on their milk choices. Um, so, you know, there's, it takes time, but it's happening. Sure. Lauren, in terms of steps people can take. Well, I think that um, when, so I, I went vegan so long ago, over 30 years ago. So I'm trying to hearken back to those days. But I think as somebody who's going vegan for the animals and is going vegan because for ethical reasons, whether it be the planet or protecting black and brown bodies, whatever the reason may be, not human animals, um, that it is, a, it is a, a change of your life. And I don't think that that can be um, dismissed at all. It is a major shift in your life when you start to see things that nobody else sees. And it pains you. And you start to feel like, I need to scream this from the mountaintops and then everybody's going to change it because I have the wisdom. And then you start pushing people away because they're like, let me come to my own decision. I don't need you telling me what to do. 
And so I think that the steps that you can take is one, is remembering why it is that you're doing it. If you're doing it for ethical reasons, then you should have, that. that is a compassionate move. That's nothing to be ashamed about. It's something we wish more people would do is have empathy and compassion for others. Um, and then I think just, you know, you don't have to become a registered dietitian in order to figure out how to eat healthier. Um, but I think that it's good to make sure you still eat enough. Um, go online if you don't have access to the internet. There's groups that can help you. We have printed materials. But, you know, that go online, find recipes. I mean, we've created websites um, to help people. Um, we're also creating a vegan Lao website. So we're trying to help more people like us that are, you know, um, black and brown people who um, want to keep eating food that's culturally relevant to us um, without the cruelty. And so it's a matter of being fair to yourself. You look up a little bit, but just keep your eyes on the prize. So what uh, eyes on the prize, what would you say to people who might say that going vegan is more expensive? For example, it's, it's like getting food that hasn't been sprayed with pesticides, that that can be more expensive. So I, are people saving money for all of you? <laughs> well, I would say that they're absolutely right in some regards. Um, that, uh, you know, one of the areas that we work on is lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities. And it is very difficult, if not impossible, to be vegan in these communities because they don't even have fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. So to some degree, it is more expensive depending on how you're eating and how you're accessing your food. Because if you're accessing the only fruits and vegetables you're getting is at a convenience store or a liquor store, that's going to cost you a lot more money. And I also guarantee you're not going to be able to feed yourself that way for more than a day or two. So sure. in some ways it's more expensive, but for those with more privilege, sure, it might be cheaper if they're eating a whole foods plant-based diet and not eating the delicious vegan ice cream that's out there. Yes, Jeff Chu, how would you answer that? Yeah, you know, you know, what I find is that, you know, you can be creative, I mean, when it comes to going vegan. Um, so you think about, I mean, rice, you know, beans, uh, different types of grains, um, you know, all those things aren't too expensive. I mean, most of those products are probably a dollar a pound or, or sometimes less, depending on where you're getting them from. Um, so if you have the desire to cook, um, you don't want convenience, you can go vegan pretty affordably. I mean, almost probably maybe $50 to $200 a week you can feed a family uh, outside of your vegetables and fruits and things of that nature. So How I much think a week it, did you say? I mean, $50 to $200 a week. I mean, you figure, I mean... For two, 50, fifty dollars, fifty dollars oh, to hundred dollars oh, a week oh, outside okay. of your vegetables and your fruits. Okay. Not, not yeah. I mean, you think yeah. about it. I mean, a, a bag of a bag of beans is a dollar uh, for one pound typically, and that can probably give you, you know, a good six to eight servings. Um, so again, but it's work. You know, a lot of times I think you know we live in a society where most of the products that we purchase from the store is already pre-made. It's easy to make. Um, you know, so sometimes cooking something like you know beans and grains and all that type of stuff where you know, they can be, or pastas, I mean, that's something that can be done vegan really easily. Um, I think, you know, there's, a, again, I, I think it could be done pretty affordably, but you got to just take the time, as Lauren said, go online and learn. Um, you know, in our company, last thing I say, like, we're one of the companies trying to make proteins, plant proteins affordable. Um, so, you know, you, we do live in a day now where there are plant-based plant protein options that are actually becoming more affordable, uh, where families can buy them, you know, where they don't have to spend, you know, too much money. So, I think in three years, I mean, plant-based protein is going to be the same price of meat, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's where we're heading in the next few years. So I think it's going to give, it's going to level the playing field even, even better, you know? Okay. Okay. Now, Jasmine, I, I could ask that same question of you. And there is a question here in our chat box that you could answer and, and you might cover that same question that everyone else has answered. And Megan asks in the chat box, she says, in your movie, you talk about the emotional connection to food. Um, how do you address your meat-eating family about changing their diet to vegan or even bringing up that subject when it's a cultural value to eat meat products? So, you know, well, luckily I have, the, I have a cheat card because I just told them, hey, you should check out my film. And then <laughs> that's it. I don't have to like preach the vegan word to anyone. But what's really, um, what's really cool is with my family, 
I, you know, I was not, I wasn't pushy at all. Didn't preach to anybody at all. My film came out years ago. They saw it years ago. And like now, like it just, like now, my mom is like, Jasmine, I've gone a few weeks without meat. My oh. aunt is on a vegan rampage. My cousin went vegan. And all that came from me just exposing them to the topic. Like even my telling my mom, hey, mom, you should check out Forks Over Knives on Netflix and leave it alone. Because when I think about how I arrived at, um, at the place I'm at now, it wasn't because someone argued me down. It wasn't some sermon that someone gave me. It was, you know, me meeting someone who kind of intrigued my curiosity and then taking that curiosity and then watching Food Inc. and then watching Cowspiracy and watching Veducated. So I kind of refer people to um, the educational resources that inspired me. And as far as price, I, you know, price when it comes to a vegan diet, I just keep in mind who I'm talking to. Because me personally, before I went vegan, I was eating really high quality food. So if I'm talking to that person, I let them know like, Hey, look, if you make a salmon salads, you know, during the week, the tofu is going to be cheaper than that salmon. You know, like meat is one of the most expensive things in the grocery store. So I just keep in mind, you know, who I'm talking to when I personalize the conversation. And if they tell me a little bit more about what they eat, I can tell them how to come up with a comparable um, diet if, if it's possible. That's interesting. Okay. So I'm just going to start at the questions and go straight down the list to get as far as we can. And the first question at the top of the list is how can a white vegan support this movement? Ivana, you haven't talked for a while. <laughs> any any ideas? Um, how can a white vegan support this movement? First of all, thank you for wanting to support this movement. Um, I think the, for me, like, the ways that you could support this movement really are to amplify black and brown voices, amplify indigenous folks who are already doing the work um, monetarily. I know right now we're in the times of COVID, but you know, like labor, manual labor, um, you know, donations, like um, getting the word out. There's so many things that um, we can be doing, but I think the easiest things you could probably do is just amplify, amplify black and brown voices that are, that are doing the work right now. Now that's a question that's also asked of Lauren and the person asks, making these connections between environment, animals, and people is critical. How can we amplify, amplify and support your work? Lauren, do you have additional things to add? Um, I uh, agree with Ivana that amplifying our work and other black and brown activists is absolutely and utterly critical. We don't get the same platforms that the very wealthy white vegan organizations get, not by far. Um, you know, so, I mean, in terms of our work in particular, it's obviously supporting our work, donating, volunteering. I think if you want to help us um, really hold a corporation accountable for the lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities, we ask you to please support our campaign against Safeway, which is prohibiting grocery stores from opening up in impacted communities that, um, that link is on our website at foodispower.org, but we need a lot of people to sign it. If it was a petition for dogs and cats, we'd have hundreds of thousands of signatures. Um, we don't have a lot because we're just trying to advocate for, for people. So we and you said food is power org, O-R-G. That O-R-G, yes, okay. thank you. And Abby asks, is there a role for local governments to address food deserts as traditionally defined, but also healthy food deserts? So I'll answer that. Um, basically, uh, the government, do they have a role in that? Um, in a sense, I guess, um, you know, they can, <laughs> the federal government's so hard for me, but I would basically say that what will help the lack of access to healthy foods in areas we consider food apartheid areas is by supporting worker-owned cooperatives so that workers own the businesses like Mandela Grocery in Oakland, where the workers live in the community, it's there to serve the community, the profits stay in the community, um, as well as providing land for people to grow their own food. Um, I think those, you know, having people off a system that was never made for them to thrive is something that, that is, unfortunately, you know, the food system was never made to benefit Black, Brown, Indigenous people. It was made to profit off of our backs. 
So we need other ways of being on a system to where we can take care of ourselves and each other. So I'm sure Jasmine and Ivana, you all may have uh, ideas that you would like to add, but I'm going to go through the questions and if there's time left, keep your ideas if there's something you might like to add to a question. So Chef Chu, Lisa asks, do you think high schools might be able to be convinced to offer vegan cooking and home economics classes to help students learn how to cook and enjoy vegan meals? I mean, 100%. I think there's a definitely a big need for that. I think there's a lot of educators uh, that are desiring. Um, I've done a lot of that actually over the years. We've had I have a vegan restaurant, nonprofit vegan restaurant in Oakland. Um, we've had uh, teachers come to our restaurant. We've done classes for, for young people, uh, all, all the way from the younger kids uh, to adults, um, not, I'm sorry, to, to high school kids, um, and even adults as well. So um, I think that education, um, there's a lot of science in cooking. Um, and so there's a lot that you can bring from, there's environmental issues that you can bring into the conversation of plant-based foods. Um, so there's a lot of subjects, social justice issues, ethical issues. Um, so it's, it's great conversations, uh, you know, for, for high school curriculum. Um, and I think it just takes educators that's in the system to advocate to really get that to be a need. And I think there's many, many chefs in many cities that can be, be, a, be of help to support that kind of movement, you know, 100%. Sure. Now, Anonymous asks, what are your thoughts on hunting for food in comparison to factory farming meat? And I'll just add to that, you know, there is this, this uh, selling of the idea of grass-fed animals being healthier for you. So if you hunt your own food, are you ahead of anything? Hello? Well, I'm a country boy. I, I, I got hunters. My dad was a hunter. My uncle's, you know, so I grew up in that environment. Um, you know, I go from the fact of this. I mean, obviously, the impact of uh, hunting is obviously not as detrimental as, I mean, I don't believe in killing at all. But the point is, is comparing that to meat, meat, meat farming or factory farming of animals is obviously a lot different. I come from the fact that, you know, I don't think physiologically we were created to eat meat. I think that, you know, by design, by who, you know, this are, are you look at the, the, the teeth structure, uh, Dr. Milton Mills is one of my mentors, I think Jasmine, he was on the, um, on the, on the Invisible Vegan documentary, he does some amazing uh, work in explaining, you know, this physiologically that we do so much better, we're made to be, um, um, you know, herbivores, um, and I think that, that, you know, obviously we can hunt, people say we're hunters and gatherers, but, you know, I, I, that argument, when you really look at the facts of our digestion, our, our teeth structure, um, that we're actually Actually better better off eating you know plant-based ingredients and um, look at the yeah. animals like cows that are herbivores, yeah. right a thousand pounds and yep. like if they can do it so Lisa asks how do you make up for the iron for those of us who are anemic Jasmine well what I found is a lot of times when I needed to take all these supplements, it was because I was eating, uh, I wasn't even eating food, I was eating food-like substances. And in the most, in most cases, like if you eat, like you can find iron in greens, like if you're just eating, you know, a diverse diet, like even, you know, paying attention to all the different colors of vegetables that you're eating, you'll pretty much hit most of your nutritional goals just by eating actual live foods well lisa also asked she says she appreciates your film and your ability ability to make going vegan so accessible and so she likes to know more about your journey in being a vegan going from going from being a carnivore and so some vegan items do have a very different taste from what you may have been brought up with did you have to learn to like the new flavors? And that's a question for all of you. Did you have to learn to like the new flavors? So Jasmine, why don't you start out? So yeah, you know, I would say um, prior to veganism, I had a pretty ratchet palate. So like, you gotta think when you're young, right? McDonald's is everything. It's like, oh my God. And then when you get used to better quality food, then you eat McDonald's and then it's greasy and you actually taste the burger and you're like, this is trash. So I think the same thing happens with veganism. When you get used to 
eating plant-based foods. And one of the fun parts about eating plant-based foods is people actually have to season it because I come from, you know, people just putting a whole bunch of salt on things, putting a lot of garlic salt on something and melting cheese on it and going like, oh, this person threw down. It's like, no, this person used a bunch of condiments, but they don't really have an understanding of flavor profiles and how to use the seasonings. So now that I'm plant-based and I'm eating all these new types of foods, it's almost like, you know, my ratchet uh, palate is a little bit more refined for healthier foods. But it was a process. Ivana, you are content to be silent, and I'm not going to let you stay silent. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make sure everybody also gets um, space to share. Um, I think it definitely does, at least for me. Um, it did take a, like a retraining of some sort, but you have to also understand like we really, you know, before being vegan and everything like that, like we really do consume the standard American diet, you know, hello, like, you know, high fructose corn syrup, like we are used to eating excessive amounts of sugar at this point. So when you eat something that's natural, you're like, ew, like where's, you know, so it does take a little bit of time. Um, but I think like for me, it just came down to reframing my relationship with food and seeing food more as like medicine, you know, as like an energetic, I guess, exchange. And so um, it really does bring a lot of joy, you know, when you can create something for yourself with love and, you know, knowing that it was nourished with like soil and sunlight, you know, just more life, you know, into your palate as opposed to the opposite. Sure. And Lauren, as you answer that question, uh, Wintro also wants you to answer to at least elaborate on the issue of Safeway. Oh, Safeway. Sure. Um, well, for me, I think that, you know, my mom, one of her second jobs was fast food. And so when she came home, um, from work, she'd always have French fries, and my sisters and I all did the fast food thing growing up, and so French fries are like seriously my comfort food, and so I'm very lucky that they happen to be vegan, but I do think that there was that transition to, and I'm, I, I would actually say I'm like 30 plus years vegan, I still think I'm transitioning because I literally am a junk food vegan. I mean, I, I just like junk food. I mean, that's just how I am, but I know that veganism is what introduced me to foods like Thai food, Ethiopian food, some foods that I don't know that I ever would have tried if I hadn't been vegan. But when I go in, in traveling or whatever I'm doing, they tend to be some of the easiest places to eat vegan. And so I feel like that being going vegan actually introduced me to some foods I never would have had before. And Thai is my favorite food. So I feel very thankful. Um, so quick answer to the Safeway question. And thank you so much for caring about this issue. It's actually an issue in Vallejo. So if you're from the Bay Area, it's in Vallejo that we're talking about, where Chef Q's business is. Um, but basically, Safeway Grocery Store around the country, um, under the umbrella of Albertsons as well, places restrictive deeds on their former properties. So in Vallejo, they had a grocery store that was in an area where seniors were living, where black and brown people were living, and they relocated miles away. And when they left that grocery store, they put what's called a restrictive deed on their former property that prevented grocery stores from moving into that location for 15 years, depriving that community of having a grocery store. And we found that they're doing this in other places. So we're trying to get them as a corporation to say, we are gonna stop this policy and we're not gonna harm the health of communities anymore. Isn't that kind of counterintuitive? Wouldn't it make sense for them to keep a store in those communities for the money that it would bring in? Well, those people are gonna have to travel to get the groceries. So they're gonna still end up traveling to a Safeway. They may have to take two buses, but they're gonna try and make that trip. Others, unfortunately, who don't have cars are ending up buying their grocery stores at convenience stores and liquor stores. Jeff Chu, you might have answered some of this, the next question, um, but the others of you might wanna to add to it. And Regina asked, how can you start educating kids so the message is received early? Oh man, um, you know, kids are like sponges. And if you're, I, what I found is that if you are excited about food, kids simply get excited about it as well. 
Um, you know, so one thing, I mean, I have two kids. They've been vegan, you know, since they were born. They're three and seven. Um, you know, they've eaten, you know, my, they, my meat, they call it, they don't know what chicken, they think my, my chicken is real chicken. <laughs> so, you know, they, they go to your house and somebody had real chicken, they might get confused thinking it's like, they wouldn't know no difference because they just have always eaten my product. But I will say that again, kids are, you know, if you, if you are excited about it, um, you make it creative. And as we lead our children and lead kids, um, I think they get excited as well. Don't get me wrong. If a kid has been eating fast food every day, I've been in places where I did a, I did a, um, um, what do you call it, a school lunch program for an urban school that wasn't used to any vegan food. Um, and it took a lot of education and persuasion. Um, so again, it's, it is hard in a school environment at times when you're counteracting maybe what they're getting from home and having to actually feed them vegan at school. But again, if you make it taste delicious, you know, kids can be, can be convinced. And um, so, yeah, so it just takes, it takes a village, really, um, to make it work. So. Sure. And Olivet wants to know, uh, Ivana mentioned, she says, Tyson, like companies are changing to gain market share and given Tyson's track record. Which companies do you recommend we support in our own purchases? Ooh, I mean, it's difficult because when you really look into it, you see that these companies who also are advocating vegan products are actually also advocating for, you know, other like political, you know, things that are harmful to us too. So like I said, you really have to just do the research and really, you know, um, yeah, just kind of find out like who's supporting these products, you know, like where is this money going? There's actually an app. I'm not sure of the name off like the top of my head but there's an app that shows you um which companies like where their um major like funding or donations for political campaigns are going to so you can actually see where these companies are kind of leaning more towards um so yeah i do know i think gardein is pro 45 so um if that's something that you don't want to support um by all means i think there's um what is morning star i think um it's a good brand but don't like don't take that from me I'll definitely Definitely do your own research and come to your own conclusion. Sure. Now, Cheryl wants to ask, what do you think about cell-based meat as a transition food for people to keep their food customs while moving toward plant-based? Jasmine, Jeff Chu, Lauren? Well, I'm in that industry, you know, I'm in the plant-based space and in the meat, meat, you know, I'm in the manufacturing space. And a lot of my, actually, my friends actually are, you know, they run companies that actually are creating those type of products. You know, you know, the many of them, like I said, I don't, I don't really, I, I think it has a place in the sense that um, it's going to reduce the ethical issues. You know, animals are not going to be killed. Um, it's not going to answer the health issues. Um, you know, it's at the same time, it's still meat. It's still meat, you know, when it comes to cholesterol. Um, so it will solve the, the ethical issues of, you know, animals not being killed, the environmental impact, um, but it will not solve the health issues. I became a vegan more so from the health issues. Um, and so, you know, I would definitely say, I would always say go to plant-based in its most natural form is the best. Um, but I'm also pragmatic, you know, in a sense to say that I wouldn't say not do it because there are people that are still going to want to eat hamburgers. And if you can actually provide something that's not as harmful to the environment, you know, it's a better step, but not the best step, you know? So, you know, I, I, that's kind of where I stand at this point. Um, you know, but I think that, I, you know, I definitely advocate plants better, but you know, sure. you know sure. yeah. Now, Isabella says, although there is of course some room to grow, feminism has become much more intersectional in recent years. So do you think the same might become true of veganism in the future? anybody. I, I will take that. I will say that there's a difference between white feminism and black and brown and indigenous feminism. And I think that white feminism has a long way to go still. Um, just as I would say the predominant vegan movement is very white. And I've been doing, you know, Food Empowerment Project was started in 2007 and they still have a long way to go. Um, unfortunately, we're, whenever, you know, we, I wrote a blog asking vegans to have sympathy for slaughterhouse workers who are diagnosed with COVID-19. And you can't imagine the hate that we received. Oh, really? We're saying, give some sympathy, from vegans, from vegans. Oh. 
vegans oh, saying right. that we should not have any sympathy for slaughterhouse workers. But, but wait a moment, you're asking people to be compassionate. Exactly. <laughs> if you're asking if you can be compassionate towards animals, what about being compassionate towards other human beings? Hence I saying that the vegan movement has a long way to go. Sure. Um, so that there yeah. are, I mean, I will say that um, not all, but the majority of black and brown vegans do understand that we've lived it. We've had family members who go through this. We, there is some knowledge there, but the movement as a whole, at least that everybody sees and gets the most exposure is the white mainstream vegan movement. And that still unfortunately has a long way to go. Sure, now Nancy says, do you have any advice for someone interested in changing their diet when their spouse is not interested in changing? How do you address eating together? So, for example, I changed my diet. And when I flipped the script, like the thing is, I wasn't raised a vegan, right? So it would be very hypocritical of me to look at people around me and judge them because they didn't arrive at a certain place at the exact moment in time that I arrived there. And then when I fell in love with my partner, I fell in love with him, you know, at a certain place just because I flipped the script you know, our love isn't contingent on whether he flips the script too. But I will say, you know, at the end of the day, like people like good food. So it's one of those things where, I mean, if you make some really amazing vegan dishes and I don't know if your partner, it doesn't matter if it's girl, boy, them, um, and they taste it and the food tastes good. I mean, if you want to kind of take the, you know, kind of take the helm and start preparing more food, I think that would help. Or, you know, and just simply asking the question instead of making it like a forceful, I want you to do this. Like, hey, you know, I'm into this. Would you mind checking out this book? Would you, you know, mind checking out this documentary? Something where you're not um, kind of trying to control your partner. Sure. Now, we still have two more questions to go, but we only have six minutes left. So I'm going to yield to Nicole to let us know if, uh, in terms of time parameters. Why don't you go ahead and, and answer one more question. And thank you so much to everybody. This is amazing, such great stuff coming out. So one more question, and then I think we'll start wrapping up. Okay, so Anonymous asked about reactions to the BBC article from a few days ago, and Anonymous gives the link. And since we all can't go to the link right now, uh, I'll ask another question by Anonymous, who in quotation marks says, no ethical consumption under capitalism is still a widely used argument used as a way to dismiss veganism. So what are the best ways to tackle this argument in a compassionate and understanding way? No ethical consumption under capitalism. I would say, I mean, um, I would say that there's still, but there's still a lesser of evils. So, you know, somebody can't make the argument, you know, oh, well, if you eat vegan food, if you eat plants and vegetables, the farm workers, what they're subjected to on the fields or their work hours or, you know, how that's not fair. But at the same time, you look at all the layers that come with eating meat. And it's like, there are way more ethical problems on that scale. So I would just say there is lesser of evils. A quick answer from anyone else. I think that, I mean, I agree. I mean, but one of the situations is when we're looking at lack of access to healthy foods, by far we want everybody growing their own food, right? But the reality is that not everybody has a privilege of owning land or even having the ability to grow their own food. And that's why we really support worker-owned cooperatives. So there has, unfortunately, until everybody is about community and taking each, care of each other in community, things like that are going to be necessary. Sure. A quick answer, Ivana. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. You know, there's no such thing as like cruelty-free under capitalism, you know. So for me, it's not just about like, oh, I'm eating vegan and boom, everything is great, you know. Um, if I'm trying to get well in my community, I also want them to be well, you know. So what does that mean? That means advocating for farm workers' rights, you know. That means, sorry, not sorry, but prison abolition. That means, you know, like anti-capitalism because that's literally what has destroyed the planet and is what's taking our livelihood, so... Nicole, thank you for the additional time. And 
I'd certainly like to thank Jasmine and Lauren and Chef Chu and Ivana. <laughs> Back to you, Nicole. <laughs> A huge thank you to all of you. Um, fabulous discussion, really great food for thought. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Robbie, who's going to close us out. Thanks, everyone.